Vampires of a certain age remind their peers and descendants of the golden age of Constantinople, where the trinity of Michael, the Dracon, and Antonius held sway. These philosophers, Atoridor, Zemitsi, and Ventru, respectively, recognized and upheld the vampire utopia of Constantinople, a combination of crusades, a Methuselah's mania, and Settite corruption tore the coterie apart. Ultimately, the dream of Constantinople, in which all vampires of disparate beliefs and practices could exist in harmony, shattered. Some still cling to the dream of hope for the Trinity's resurrection in some form. You may still believe that the Dracon can be brought back to his former enlightenment, or that one of the new trinities of Constantinople or Istanbul hold the key to the domain's growth and revitalization. Conversely, perhaps you study the disciples of the Trinity with wary eyes, preparing to take down a colossal threat to all traditions. Greetings, Kindred. I am Voivode Baquet, and welcome back to our world of darkness. And tonight we're going to be going over the Trinity, the lore sheet that deals with the vampiric utopian ideals of Constantinople. This is a very dark age uh, topic, but the idea of this lore sheet is that it is brought back to the modernites with new fervor, as Kindred of the modern knights attempt to recreate what was once upheld in the lost fabled utopia of Constantinople. Investing one dot into this lore sheet gets you Constantinople. Outside the Ashira, vampire tradition refers to Istanbul as Constantinople. You are one of the few who know why. Constantinople represented everything possible in a city where vampires shared ideas and discussed philosophy without falling to carnage. Once per story, you can ask the storyteller a question about Constantinople's past and be given an accurate answer. So investing one trait into this lore sheet basically gets you lore that you can utilize to help build on what your current domain has. You can utilize information from the past to build a better tomorrow. In this lore sheet, storytellers are going to have to have an idea of what they are going to give to you in given situations. So, again, I say this a lot, I understand. When a player takes a lore sheet, they are telling the storyteller what kind of thing they want included in the game they're playing in. Investing two dots into this lore sheet gets you Antonius's architecture. Renowned for his architectural skill, both political and physical, the Ventru Antonius built the structure that held Constantinople together. To some, he fathered the Primogen Ideal. You study Antonius's methods. You can add two dice to any politics dice pool when making a test involving domain government. Once per story, you can mediate and calm any court debate quashing violence with action or prudity. I like the fact that this one not only gives you a mechanic, but also a thought process. The idea that your character can stand up and go, stop. This is going in a way that we don't want it to go into. We are trying to handle things in a diplomatic sense. 
we are going to devolve into blathering beasts and we need to not do that. That is always a benefit, to be able to stop the violence before it happens. And this is, this is what this gives you. I like the idea that it also says that it, it embodies the primogen ideal also. This is something that could possibly get you into a leadership position due to the fact that people see you. Now, that is not to say that this point automatically gets you into a leadership position. I'm just saying that with the way that it can be played out as a role play advantage, you could very well find yourself in a seat of leadership due to the fact that you are able to know a little bit more about political dealings and also how to build things both physically and, and metaphorically. But being able to just end the conflict before it happens is, is a leadership quality in my opinion. Investing three dots into this lore sheet gets you the dream. For a millennium, the Trinity practiced Michael's dream. A vision of vampire utopia. Michael encouraged all vampires in Constantinople to learn and seek enlightenment. Grow distant from the beast and become something beyond mere predators. You are a modern exponent of of the dream. Recognized as a speaker of the dream in your city, you can add one die to any insight dice pool when testing to gauge another's beast. You inspire and calm souls. Once per story, you can spend a willpower point to allow another vampire to reroll up to three dice when resisting frenzy. Adding an extra die to your pool to be able to read someone's bestial nature is, is worth it. But the ability to allow someone to re-roll three dice to resist the beast taking over is a, a, a great additive when you're playing a game that's built on social maneuvering that has a handicap such as the beast that can ruin social interactions. I think that having something like this, having, having a, I don't know, a radiance about you, a calming nature that can actually reach out and, and affect others is, is, is an interesting little additive that can, that can lead characters to, I don't know, almost seem almost seems sage-like. Investing four dots into this lore sheet gets you the Dracon. Of the Trinity, only the Zamitsi known as the Dracon survive Constantinople's fall. Passionate and wise, the lover of both Antonius and Michael, and spiritual guide for the Trinity, the grieving Dracon fell silent for many centuries following Antonius's murder. Rumors whisper that the Dracon re-emerges now with unclear intent. You count yourself as one of his disciples and likely know how to find him. He counts as a five-dot mala, assisting with spiritual and discipline matters. Having the Dracon as a five dot mala to help you out on spiritual and discipline matters is terrifying. <laughs> but it really matters how the storyteller is going to project that character's personality. What does the Dracon want? Is he filled with the need for vengeance? Is he is he seeking some sort of revenge? Is is he wanting to see the dream of Constantinople be rebuilt through New Kindred in a new location. That's 100% up to the storyteller, and having him use a character as as basically a, a, a eyes and ears in a in a domain 
I don't know. That's 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 a fourth generation Zamithi that's just kind of running around doing things, and that's terrifying in my opinion. I I don't like the idea of Methuselahs running around my game <laughs> personally, um, but being able to utilize them that that really does open you up to pretty much every discipline, right there. Um, but also. Are you going to have to feed from them? Are you becoming more and more their thrall as you're utilizing this? I, I might be digging far too into this, and some other people might just look at this as a great opportunity. But I always look at most lore sheets as a double-edged blade in my own practice of storytelling. It does make me wonder how other people view these things. Are these just benefits, or should there be unforeseen downfalls connected. Investing five dots into this lore sheet gets you the new trinity. One night, Michael's Constantinople will be reborn, and you shall assist at that birth. You know this is not from fragile ego, but from certain prophecy. You, along with two others who complement your skills without mirroring them, will rebuild Constantinople in a new city no matter what you must do. If you earn them on the path of bringing about a new trinity, you can remove up to five stains per story before making a remorse test. I, I personally think this one probably could have been written a little better. Um, it mirrors very much one that is in the LARP version. Um, but basically what this is saying is you can defuse, erase, however you want to put it, five stains per story in the way that I read this, it means in yourself and your two others, the, the other members of your new rebuilt Trinity, um, and that, that can be very, very big, uh, because it has to deal with whether or not you can do things that are going to be considered immoral, or, or breaking of your chronicle tenets, or breaking of your personal convictions, but you're doing it for a good reason. This is really a, a um, end justifies the means kind of situation. I see this meaning that you can do that for your entire little Constantinople polycule you're building, your, your three individuals that you're working with. The way that the tabletop sheet has it written out, it kind of sounds like it's saying just for yourself. But they do put a lot of emphasis on the fact that you have two others. So this is going to be up to storyteller and player to decide how exactly this is going to work in your game. Much like a lot of these lore sheets, they are going to be something that needs to be a discussion when you take it. The lore sheet for the Trinity traces its roots back all the way past what we consider the Dark Ages most of the time. This isn't like European castles and stuff like this. This is this is way back. This is this is way back, and it opens up a lot of interesting roleplay that has to deal with the concept of cyclical time and how that can affect the world of darkness. Things repeat themselves. And in this case, you've decided to take a lure sheet where you're trying to rebuild the glory days from Long Night's past before such thing as a masquerade existed. So how exactly is that going to be when you rebuild your utopian society? I am Voivode Maquette. Thank you for joining me in Our World of Darkness and a look at the Trinity lore sheet that is found in the core book for Vampire the Masquerade. And I cannot wait to see you in the next one. Good evening.